being affected by these protests. These protests that are harming our economy and our fellow citizens. That is why we will continue to be there to support science, to support the police services, and to end both the protests and the pandemic. Canada's Prime Minister is pandering to politics by division, stoking anger and fear. The rhetoric he used towards those Canadians who support lifting the mandate adds fuel to the fire. These are not the actions of a Prime Minister. A senior member of the Liberal caucus has publicly criticized his tone, his language, and his approach to the pandemic. Will the Prime Minister act like a Prime Minister? Will he listen to the opposition, listen to his own caucus? Will he listen to Canadians? Or will he continue with this divisive rhetoric? Here, here, here. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. At the beginning of the pandemic, our government has been laying out with great transparency what we believe is the best way out of this pandemic, and that's vaccinations. And I want to give credit to the 90% of Canadians who've taken up that cause, the 90% of truckers who've taken up the cause of vaccinations to ensure that the wheels of our economy continue to, to turn. As for those who are outside, Mr. Speaker, this government is working very closely with the City of Ottawa to provide the police all of the tools and the resources that they need to end this convoy as quickly and as peacefully as possible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable member for Foothills. Canadians, including a senior member of the Liberal caucus, are speaking loud and clear. Justin, just go up the left. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to ask the honourable member from Foothills to stop while his members on his side are heckling him. So I'll let, the, I'll let, him, I'll let him continue now. The honourable member for Foothills. Canadians, including senior members of the Liberal caucus, are speaking loud and clear. Canadians are looking for pandemic leadership. Canadians are standing up right now, grabbing this moment in our history, because they know there is something fundamentally wrong when a Prime Minister refuses to listen. Countries around the world are changing direction, but here in Canada, our Prime Minister resorts to playground antics and calling names. If ever there was a time for inspired leadership, it is now. Will the Prime Minister grow up? Will he do his job? Will he listen to Canadians? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased and grateful for the members' use of pandemic leadership. This is exactly that, this pandemic leadership, Mr. Speaker. We all have the responsibility to work together, to listen to each other, to listen to science, what science has told us and what science... I'm going to have to interrupt the Honourable Minister of Health. I'm having a hard time hearing him, and I, I really wanted to hear the answer, as I'm sure the Honourable Member for Foothills, who asked the question, would like to hear the answer. I'm going to ask the Honourable Mi Minister to start right from the top so we can hear the whole answer, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm glad to do that because I thought the question was the, the right statement. They spoke about leadership, pandemic leadership. That's exactly the point, Mr. Speaker. We need to be leader in managing the pandemic. We need to be united together, working together, listening to each other. We have a hard job to do, Mr. Speaker, which is to look after the health of millions of Canadians who depend on us to protect their health and the health of those that they love. Bravo, bravo. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg-Haute Saint-Charles. Mr. Speaker, this morning, we heard from the chair of the Liberal Quebec Caucus. And according to him, we're right. We've been asking for a more united approach, an approach that is based on science. But the prime minister is demonizing those who disagree with him. Will he finally end petty politics, which is just making the situation worse? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank my colleague from the Quebec City region, who knows my colleague for Louis Hébert and who knows what esteem, in what esteem we hold him and his hard work. He's, my colleague spoke about unity, and that's a great word to use because we are united in Canada. We are united in fighting this pandemic. And what brings us together and what unites us is vaccination, Mr. Speaker. It works. 99% of public servants are vaccinated and they are not only protected for themselves, but they protect others. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg-Haute-Saint-Charles. 
Mr. Speaker, this morning, the member for Louis Hébert and chair of the Quebec Liberal Caucus was clear. He asked his own government to create a roadmap, a game plan to see where we're going with this. That's what we've been asking this prime minister for for two years. But nothing, no results. Instead, the prime minister has preferred to politicize this pandemic. He doesn't like to listen to advice either from the opposition or even from his own MPs. Many Canadians agree with us. Will he finally understand what they're saying? Stop dividing people and create a road plan, just as the member for Louis Hébert has asked. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My colleague is right to say that, indeed, we've had a plan for two years since the beginning of the pandemic. And it has worked. It has avoided deaths. Thanks to the measures we've brought in, thanks to listening to the science, we can deduce that we have saved about 50,000 lives if we compare with what we've seen south of the border. We've also helped support the economy. But I must say that if we had listened to the opposition's advice, we would be in an economic crisis and we wouldn't... I know he's protected and I'm happy about it. And I also know that he's protecting everyone around him. So it's not just a very important personal decision that we take when we have the right vaccine status. It also means we are reaching out to protect those around us. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister is double vaccinated, had his booster, and just contracted COVID-19. So using mandates to discriminate against Canadians based on their vaccine status is absolutely punitive and discriminatory. A senior Liberal called on the Prime Minister to stop dividing Canadians on the issue of vaccine status. When will the Prime Minister start listening to the science, start listening to public health officials, start listening to his own members of Parliament? Parliament and end his campaign of discrimination and division against Canadians. The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, I wish to speak with respect but also with honesty. I'm a bit troubled by what I hear, which is the belief that vaccination doesn't work. Mr. Speaker, vaccination does work. About a year ago, science gave us the gift of vaccination. We had waited for that for an entire year, Mr. Speaker. Since then, we have millions of Canadians have chosen to do the right thing, which is to get vaccinated. I'm very troubled by the fact that on the opposite side of this house, there are still people that don't believe in vaccination. Attention, please. Thank you. Okay. I just want to remind everyone that we're in question period and we want to hear the question and the answers. We have and then I'll expect their financial situation to improve this year. Almost 60% of Canadians are having a tough time putting food on their table. And the average family grocery bill will go up $1,000 this year. Constituents are emailing me copies of the highest home heating bills they have ever received. And payroll taxes will take about $700 off the average family's paychecks this year. People are being squeezed. 
Why is this government not addressing the unmanageable squeeze that is being put on hard-working families, making it difficult every day to just pay for basic necessities? Yeah. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. will take no lessons from the Conservatives when it comes to supporting the most vulnerable Canadians. It was our government that introduced the CCB, which is indexed for inflation and which has already lifted almost 300,000 children out of poverty. It's our government that increased the GIS. That is also indexed to inflation, Mr. Speaker, and it has helped over 900,000 seniors. When we formed government in 2015, more than 5 million Canadians lived in poverty. Mr. Speaker, by 2019, that number had dropped to 3.7. The Honourable Member for King Bond. Mr. Speaker, in my riding of King Bomb, constituents are concerned with keeping their homes. Years ago, I worked in banking. The Honourable Member for Kenora. Mr. Speaker, the uh, IISD Experimental Lakes Area in my riding is a state-of-the-art and world-renowned freshwater laboratory. In their latest election platform, the Liberals promised a $37.5 million investment to support their work. Is the government still committed to keeping this promise, and will we see the funding in the next budget? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague for, for his question, and I agree with him. It is a very important scientific centre I find it somewhat ironic that he would ask the question since it is the Conservative government that cut funding for this very important international experiment. But make sure, Mr. Speaker, that we will be there to continue to, continue to finance good science in Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for dufferin Caledon. Mr. Speaker, new businesses get no support from this government. It's 2022. We're entering the third year of the pandemic. Did they think no one would open a new business in those three years? In my riding, Spirit Tree Cidery is shutting down indoor dining for at least a year. Other businesses in my riding have closed or they're on the verge of closing. Does this Liberal government not realize they are literally killing new businesses? Here, here. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's really time for the Conservatives to pick a lane and decide what side they're on on the big issues facing our country. Half of their questions are about how there is too much government spending and how our government should not be supporting Canadian businesses. In fact, these are the Conservatives who voted against Bill C-2, which provided much-needed lockdown support. And now we're hearing from them that there should be more support? Really, the party of flip-flops, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Calgary Confederation. Mr. Speaker, last Parliament... Uh, Last year, Parliament unanimously passed my private member's bill that would help Canadians uh, register as organ and tissue uh, donors through their annual tax return. Support from all parties was an encouraging sign to thousands of Canadians awaiting a life-saving transplant. Sadly, nothing has happened since. The Minister has not even given me the courtesy of a response to my request for an update. She owes all the members in this House an update. Will the Minister tell us why we have not seen any progress from her or the Canada Revenue Agency? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With the passage of C-210, CRA will undertake conversations with its provincial and territorial counterparts. Those discussions will take some time, but we're acting as quickly as possible. It's very unlikely that anything will happen before the next tax season, but I thank my colleague for his sustained efforts, and I would encourage him to contact my office for updates. To resolve the situation. Cumberland Colchester. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, I remember clearly in March 2020 making a pandemic plan for my regional hospital. At that time and ever since, this government has been too little, too late, or not at the right time. Canadians need hope for their futures. 
When, Mr. Speaker, is this Liberal government going to show leadership and give Canadians a much-needed plan to learn to live with COVID-19? The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, thank you to you and thank you to my colleague for raising that important question. We've been working together since March 2020 to fight the biggest, largest health crisis in a hundred years in Canada. We've gone through that crisis successfully, certainly with respect to many other countries in the world, and that's because we have worked together, we have no, help each other, provinces and territories, the federal government. We have invested $8 out of 10 in total economic support, $63 billion of health and safety investments, in addition to all of the other investments that we've making for many years. For Cumberland Colchester. Mr. Speaker, most provincial medical officers of health have begun to speak of living with COVID, and even Health Canada's own Dr. Tam has said the virus will be endemic. Nova Scotia's Dr. Strang has spoken of initial steps needed to move forward. When will this government rely on science, not the spin doctors, and the advice of its own experts, and remove lockdowns, restrictions, and mandates? Give Canadians the date. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A very key, very key uh, signal, I should say, Mr. Speaker, to be against vaccination is to be in favor of lockdowns. The only way to fight lockdowns is to be in favor of vaccination. That's why, Mr. Speaker, I would again invite all the opposition members, including the new Conservative leader, to exert new leadership and ask all members of the Conservative Party to be vaccinated. That's the only way to avoid lockdowns. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, a senior Liberal has shared their concerns that the government mandates are divisive and harmful to the Canadian people. The Prime Minister and his government need to stop politicizing the pandemic because it's fracturing our society and dividing Canadians. Yes. Will the Prime Minister listen to the voices within his own party and present Parliament and the rest of Canada with something, anything, to end the mandates and end the restrictions and allow us to start living with COVID? Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'll say something which me, uh, my honourable colleague already knows most likely is that the lockdown measures to which she refers are provincial decisions made by provinces and territories. I believe no one in this House is confused between federal and provincial responsibilities. The federal responsibility has been and will be there to support provinces and territories moving forward. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, somebody needs to tell the Minister that it's 2022. The redundant PCR testing and asymptomatic, for asymptomatic fully vaccinated travellers doesn't make any sense. Permanent travel restrictions are not the answer because the current ones are ineffective. The government's duplicative arrival testing regime is out of step with the world. It takes up to a week for those results. That means forced quarantines, high costs for families. Yeah. When will the government join our allies and drop these ineffective travel yeah. restrictions? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And working with our allies is exactly what we had to do and what we did. We've obviously worked with the United States, which is our closest ally, very successfully over the last few months. Now, the mandates uh, to which she refers, the, the border mandates in particular regarding vaccination, are entirely symmetrical and aligned with what the United States are doing and will continue to work with our allies. I just want to remind the Honourable Member, some of... Order. Order. I just want to remind the Honourable Members that some of you don't realize how strong your voice is. Even if you're muffled with your face mask, it really echoes through. And I mean, I, I, I would just ask people to respect each other and not shout at each other. Sorry, Apology accepted. <laughs> Speaker, on the Liber Liberal government's watch, online platforms were used to fund the ongoing occupation in Ottawa. 
Millions of dollars have been raised for convoy organizers whose stated purpose is to overthrow the government. Canadians are rightly concerned that these platforms have become tools used to help foreign actors undermining our democracy. In response to the lack of federal leadership, I brought a motion to the Public Safety Committee to examine how this could be allowed to happen. Will the government ensure that foreign funds and anonymous donations are never again used to help those attacking our democracy? Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to begin by thanking my honourable colleague for his question and for the impending work which he will do in conjunction with the Committee uh, on Standing Public Safety Matters. I think this is a very important matter, and certainly over the course of the last number of days, uh, we have seen uh, GoFundMe take appropriate actions, asking the right questions about where certain funds were coming for, what they would be used for. And certainly to the extent uh, that, this, that the committee will be looking at this issue very closely, uh, I think we all need to be seized uh, with uh, the landscape as it exists around foreign interference and any funds which may be used to undermine public safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, the minister talks about being seized with urgency, but it is 12 days that health care workers, small business owners, and Ottawa residents and others have been harassed by some members of the convoy. Far-right extremists in the U.S. and elsewhere are trying to bring their radical views to Canada. They're funding extremists, they're empowering racism and anti-Semitism, and they're threatening to overthrow our government. Why has it taken so long to respond to this ongoing crisis and the foreign funded interference that is threatening our citizens, our country, and our democracy. Mr. for Public Safety. I want to assure my colleague, uh, Mr. Speaker, that we have very strong laws to prevent the kind of illegal conduct that she has referred to, uh, any funds that would go towards undermining public safety, national security, or indeed our democracy will be taken with the utmost seriousness by our law enforcement as well as our intelligence community. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to the work that the committee will do. We will re receive the report in this chamber and we will continue to unite around the need to ensure that our laws are upheld. Yes, we will have vigorous debates, but always in accordance with the rule of law. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Mr. Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic has emphasized to my constituents in Kitchener-Conestoga and to all Canadians how crucial it is to have access to a reliable and affordable high-speed internet. Investments in broadband connectivity create jobs and improve access to online learning and healthcare services. Can the Minister of Rural Economic Development provide an update to this House on the government's project in delivering high-speed internet across this country? Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Minister for Rural Economic Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my friend and colleague for that wonderful question. Throughout the pandemic, families and businesses without access to affordable and high-speed internet were faced with additional challenges, accessing online learning, putting their businesses online, and connecting with loved ones. But, Mr. Speaker, in the last few weeks alone, we've announced over $8 million in funding to projects to connect an additional 4,000 households all throughout rural Canada. We have a plan to connect every Canadian to high-speed internet all across the country, and we're delivering on that plan, Mr. Speaker. February is Heart Month in Canada, and the Heart and Stroke Foundation is running their annual fundraising campaign. Approximately 750,000 Canadians face a daily struggle with heart failure, and last November, following a heart attack, I became one of them. I encourage everyone listening to learn and regularly review the signs and symptoms of a cardiac episode. Swift action and diagnosis could be a difference between life and death. I personally thought my symptoms were minimal, but I got checked out anyway, and thank goodness I did. I must recognize my doctors of Estvan, Dr. Sheikh and Dr. Choi, for their quick action and continued care. I would like to thank the staff of the Regina General Hospital Cardiac Care Unit, including the doctors, nursing staff, and technicians for your commitment to providing quality care for your patients. I would also like to specifically mention my cardiologist, Dr. Lavoie, and my angioplasty specialist, Dr. Booker. These incredible doctors are the reason why I am still here speaking to you today, and I cannot thank them enough. And finally, to those who say the politicians don't have a heart, I now have surgical proof I do. 